Hey everybody, it's Alex from Heavy New York. We are back at the Gramercy Theater, and today we are here with Mike of The Devil Wears Prada. Thank you so much for your time, Mike. Yeah, man. No worries. Yeah. So you're performing with Roots Above and Branches Below in its entirety. What I was curious about, you know, now that this record's been out for a decade, do you have like a different perspective on this record now as opposed to when you first put it out? Yeah, certainly. I mean, we've always been pretty... Uh, uh, forthright and outspoken about not really loving our old material <laughs> and I say that as generously as possible we do not like our older material uh, but at the same time we did when we wanted to celebrate this record and it, it it does feel close enough versus if we were to do plagues um, but it, it's been really great actually I, I thought that it might drag it's the longest set we've ever played um, but it actually really flies by it feels like it goes faster than like some of the 40 minute sets like the Parkway set or that was I think 35 minutes, but um, yeah, it, it goes by fast, and uh, it, it's been cool talking to a lot of folks that the record meant something to them, you know, 10 years ago, and in a different stage of all of our lives, you know, so. Yeah, I discovered you guys on that record cycle at the Kill Switch or Phil Switch Engage show and Dark Tranquility, and I was, I was actually very impressed. I didn't really, like, who would have thought that you'd be playing that in its entirety? <laughs> I can't believe it was 10 years later. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good times. Yeah, that was, you mentioned that before we started this, but uh, yeah, that was uh, right before we did Zombie EP. Um, great tour. Good times. Yeah, yeah. Now, being that you put out a handful of records after uh, With Roots Above, do you maybe like play these, have a different approach to these songs, playing them live? Do you add maybe something new to the table, or are you just trying to play this album in its entirety? We we blast through it, but there are some changes. Uh, we did like a, we have like a little bit of a jam, this little instrumental part before we play assistant to the regional manager. There's like a sample before give me half and uh, Des Moines, um, and then uh, louder and thunder is totally different. It's more how we would approach the song these days, as far as being much more guitar driven, um, but still the same vocal parts and whatnot. And the the sing alongs have been amazing the whole run so it is a few parts tiny rewritten but for the most part it's started we only stop once once we start playing the record um yeah and we just blast through we also tune the whole thing down the record itself was mostly drop d and drop b and we play it all in b oh. nowadays so interesting yeah now as you mentioned i know you've been outspoken about uh not liking your earlier material which Hurts because Rosemary had an accident is another <laughs> song that I freaking love. But did maybe playing this album in its entirety maybe give you a little bit more appreciation towards your older material? Can we maybe hear Plagues in its entirety? We no one will ever hear Plagues in its entirety. <laughs> um, that would be a uh, cold day in hell. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, I, th I think you know I've as much as like older material is what it is, and you know we we kind of look down on it. Uh, I, I've always admired our honesty and that's something that I've always been un unapologetic, un unapologetic about as far as, you know, it wasn't like we were saying things for the sense of money or fame or any of that bullshit, you know. It, it was always coming from a very authentic, real place in us. Um, so it, it's cool to look back on that and, and still, even though I have different varying opinions on some of the things I wrote on the record, um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, nostalgic and cathartic, all all in all. And um, as far as songwriting goes, it, it definitely even writing a new record right now. We uh, we know we need to include some riffs because that's all with Roots Above is this riff, 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 yeah. riff, riff. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Now, what I was always curious about for you is, do you need to hear music in order to come up with lyrics, or has there ever been a time where you had like a lyrical concept or a story and that determined the whole composition? Oh, um, I don't, I've, I've kind of always approached it similar. Something we're doing, writing a new record right now, something we've been doing is that I'll write a song's worth of lyrics and then write the song to it. Um, we certainly have times where we write to vocal parts, but there's never been where I have like, in like a sort of like a poor piece of poetry and then say like this, this would work as the chorus and then John and Kyle and the band will like write around it. So... I think to answer your question, we've kind of approached it from as many different angles as possible as far as working. I mean, early on, it was just, hey, here's the song, write vocals, put it over top of it. And that's just how it always was. Um, I think in that we want to create more of an identity and uh, um, 
more composition to each song, more of a story and a narrative to each individual piece. Um, that's had to change as far as rather than just having 12 songs with 12 sets of lyrics over it, we've changed it, uh, if that answers your question. Definitely, definitely. At all. Now, I know that I was debating on asking this. I know you probably have had to answer this before, and I can only imagine you hate it, but I was always very curious since I discovered you guys. Your song titles are very unique. Ben has a kid. Hey, John, what's your name again? Rosemary had an act. Like, where do these song ideas come from? Is that, like... Is there like, does that add to the message of the song or is it? No, no. It was just like, we always heard goofy songs like Dillinger and Under Oath and whatnot. It's like these, you know, sort of uh, lackadaisical song titles, Eat It as well. Um, and we didn't want to, the songs were always very serious, but we've always had a very uh, prevailing sense of humor in the band. And we all have a, a, a particular sense of comedy amongst the group. Um, so back then we were just like, eh, just call it whatever. And that's what we did. I think the furthest it went and with Reads Above was actually the last time we didn't have serious song names from there. We started actually giving the name, the, the songs real names. Uh, but with Reads Above was like shout out to different guys in the crew back at then. Mm -hmm. So like Ben was our tour manager, uh, sound guy for like 10 years, um, he now has two kids. Back then, he only had one kid. Oh. Um, Robert, our tour manager for a while, he used to always say, give me half. Mm -hmm. Wiggly was a guitar tech. Uh, Wild Man was our friend Steven. <laughs> uh, he actually lives in Brooklyn. I showed him up before the show. But So, yeah, with Roots Above had a few song titles that were just like uh, – sort of inside jokes with our, our crew guys it's good to know that you guys actually have a great appreciation towards your crew but can you please write another song now saying ben has two kids we talked about it we we said uh we were gonna call it like ben has responsibility now or like <laughs> ben ben wanted it, him to, he wanted the song to be called ben has still got it <laughs> so but oh my god a, inappropriate that would <laughs> I, I, i'm just saying that would be awesome Please, at least make it a B-side. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's funny because you mentioned, like, the sense of humor in your band. But I could s your music is still very technically impressive. Like, you know, the intro, the guitar intro to Assistant to the Regional Manager. Did I say that completely right? I think. Yeah. But, like, I, there is, I, I feel like you guys have a perfect bridge between having a sense of humor and taking your music seriously, right? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't ever find humor so much approach itself in Prada in the songs. Um, but I think, I don't know, our general persona, personality is certainly nef never meant to be taken too serious. After our, we are called the Devil Wars Prada, which is stupid. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I never really find comedy playing much part in Prada songs, but it is certainly a part of my life, and I definitely appreciate certain music that uh, really does confront comedy. Awesome. You know, a band like Psycho Stick, you know, I mean, or a Guar, you know, there's always like humor in that. And like, yeah, yeah. I, I like, for me, I kind of get it, like, especially like Primus. I yeah. like Primus, and Primus is definitely something that, like, I don't know, like, it's almost uh, one of the most predominant emotions I receive from Primus is to laugh rather than you know, to get angry or something you might feel with more aggressive music, but... I still laugh that Les Claypool actually tried out for Metallica. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that till recently when I read uh, a biography on Primus and it went over that, but I didn't know that till like, last year, strangely. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, also this year you put out your uh, new record, God Alone, uh, Ben Shoulders, mm -hmm. and uh, I've noticed that I have, like, two questions about this record. Um, how different of a mind frame were you in songwriting process-wise for that particular record as opposed with The Devil Wears Prada? It's entirely different as, or that's the goal at least. I would never ever want anything to be able to like cross lines from Prada to God alone. Um, the objective between the bands are entirely, entirely different um, in, in what we look to explore and what we want to create sonically and lyrically. Um, so yeah, it's a different headspace. It's more, it's obvious, it's kind of a post-rock, post-punk band. Uh, I've, I've, I've spoken about this as I've aged and started to create more things rather than just a bunch of Devil Wars Prada records as far as really compartmentalizing my, uh, creative ambitions to basically go to this or to go to that or to go to that, whether it's Prada or God Alone or a writing project or a book project, um, so yeah, I, I try to be very uh, intentional as far as not 
giving some kind of Prada notion in a different component of, or faction of my life okay. uh, just seems really repetitive and foolish. Yeah. Well, I've noticed with God Alone, it was way more experimental. I feel like Devil Wears Prada definitely has like a formula with you and Jeremy's lyrics working well together and stuff. But like, is it fair to say that God Alone was a little more flexible, I guess, for lack of better words, to kind of go outside the box? Certainly in in the sense of narrative, I can talk about things in God Alone that I would never write for Prada or speak of in Prada. It just doesn't feel like it has a place in a metalcore song. Um, which I really love. I love being able to talk about other things rather than be pigeonholed into a metalcore lyric formula, you know. Um, which isn't to say that, you know, there's, there. obviously I still create what I hope is new and original material within the metalcore format. Um, but yeah, a part of God Alone, and like Kyle and I talked about it, uh, he, like, it was almost like we kind of devised God Alone a little bit as saying like, what's a band where you, where you don't shoot down an idea? Where, like, if it's really out of the pocket, it makes it better because it's just that strange yeah. or uncomfortable or whatever the emotion being pervaded is. Um, so that's a little bit of it. I, I still really look forward to doing more. Um, I always yearn to, to write for God Alone. Um, unfortunately, we're pretty stagnant at the moment, unfortunately. But um, I would love to just go more minimal. That's a part of where I would go. And I would never consider Prada a minimal band. We have layers upon layers upon layers uh, God alone, I could would love a guitar and vocal for ten minutes and be perfectly satisfied <laughs> with whatever that emotion might be conveyed. So, yeah. um, sorry, yeah. got off your question. No, no, you answered it perfectly. But and I, I was it kind of led me into that question because I know that you wanted to keep Devil Wears Prada and God Alone completely separate. But does maybe like working with another project allow you to come back to Devil Wears Prada with like a breath of fresh air and kind of like certainly, yeah, it, it's. Uh, Definitely. It, it's uh, it's like if you're doing the same exercise over and over and over or you're playing one sport and then you move to another kind of athletic, you, you're, you're able to oh, – that's a poor analogy. But, uh, yeah, it, it freshens everything up by all means. Uh, I can't – if I'm in the same headspace just forever, then um, it's not – it's going to constrict what – could be uh, my creativity, I think. Awesome. And uh, I have two more questions for you, but um, one question I have going back to your lyrics is, do you tend to like to leave your lyrics open to interpretation, or is there ever a time where you're trying to express something from yourself that you would like your fans to understand? Uh, I think it varies, and I certainly don't like the obligation either way. I don't want people to think, like, oh, they, like it's, you know, written by me so it has to have this specific meaning or it's written by me so it, it's really up for interpretation I think that I've tried to establish a lot of identity like I mentioned earlier in the songs these days rather than like just a hodgepodge of a bunch of different ideas which is kind of where with Roots Above was at there was, there's a lot of songs that could you could take one part out and put it in a different song and what we try to do now is that everything that exists can only exist in the space in which it is uh, song wise uh, so with that, I, I, I think it really varies on, on what the, um, what the song is. I think even if you were to look at God alone and where some of that is, is certainly a bit of interpretation, um, and that I like to explore ideas in a more abstract sense. And with that, it's in, in the... I think generally expressionism leaves that that kind of uh, open-endedness. But then when I think about certain Prada songs, they just are exactly what they are, and I can't imagine any other storyline being sort of extracted or put on top of like a song like To the Key of Evergreen, where it's just like, this is what the song is, here's the narrative. And um, I don't know, I, I feel like sometimes... I've or oftentimes, especially like back on the zombie EP and whatnot, p people sometimes like to try and for some reason put a lot more meaning to the songs or a lot of like hidden message. But I've never really been trying to disguise or do anything like some conspiracy in the song. Or whatever. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, I'm quite forthright in in the songs messages, and uh, I can assure most people that if you want to apply some strange Christian overtone to zombie EP, then you're definitely overthinking it.
Well, when somebody tells me like what their interpretation of a song is, sometimes they overanalyze it so much that I could actually smell smoke coming out of their yeah. ears <laughs> as they're like yeah. interpreting it. And uh, the final question I'd like to ask you is, is because Devil Wears Prada has played with so many different bands. As I mentioned, the first time I saw you was with Kill Switch or Phil Switch Engage and Dark Tranquility, but then you just recently played with Parkway Drive. You were on Mayhem Fest with Slayer, King Diamond, and Hell Yeah. Do you notice like a different reaction to your music depending on what crowd you're playing in front of certainly yeah i mean the first time we did mayhem tour as well was slayer and slipknot and that's a, a very real audience you're going in front of um we we toured with kill switch for a second time about a year and a half ago almost two years ago with anthrax the anthrax crowd is definitely <laughs> not not nothing uh no overlaps with prada fans i don't think still a great tour I love like both <laughs> yeah i i I mean, I love Slayer, but at the same time, like, I would never want to be a direct support band for Slayer. <laughs> or, you know, like, that's that's terrifying. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, you, you know, I, I think we try to approach it bravely when you have very intimidating acts that you're supporting. Um, I don't know. It, it's it's almost a little directionless. You get to a certain point where you just end up on tours, and especially these days where we are very uh, – pretty let down and I'm trying to think of a better word really disappointed with a lot of the music that's being created especially the backtrack world that we now exist within and hate it deeply deeply loathe it <laughs> um so we're we're not easy to please as far as the bands we tour with um but with that when you get of something so real as being able to watch Gary and Carrie and Slayer and Tom you know, like every night is just unbelievable you know yeah so um yeah we've we've always wanted to try to to break different lines we, we always saw kill switch and Asley dying doing that as far as being able to play like like these hard rock mayhem type festivals and then being able to go play like warp tour yeah. or play with you know under oath or something um so yeah we 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 devise our set list we don't mean to compromise it but we definitely go about it intentionally and um planning things out that will hopefully appease to whichever crowd we're playing yeah, well, I feel like a band like Atreyu is a good example. Mm. I mean, they toured also, with Lamb, yeah. they toured with Lamb of God, and then like right after that, they toured with Taking Back Sunday. So yep. like, I feel like with the whole metalcore style, I mean, people like to make fun of it all they want, but like, I I don't you know a pure black or death metal band can't exactly go out with Fozzy. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that would be awesome, but yeah, it depends your taste. Atreyu is another a great example. We toured with them in Australia a few years ago, and they are a fantastic band. Yeah, they just played here actually a oh, couple nice. of weeks ago, and that was a pretty crowded show. Nice, nice. Yeah, I don't think they were on the stage for the majority of the night. They were always in the audience. Back it. Yep. So before we go, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Um, just uh, you mentioned that you're working on a new album now. When could we be expecting it? Uh, we're still in the the planning stages as far as. 100% locking in studio time, although it's looking like uh, late March, April-ish or something. Um, and hopefully a record uh, November. I would love November. That's what I'm kind of aiming at, but we also don't want to rush it and compromise yeah. the rollout process, especially because we're trying to do something very different this time around and so put out a record be, people haven't heard. So it's not going to be like a direct follow-up to Transit Blues? It's going to be like... A no, we actually had, when we first started writing, Kyle and John had almost 30 songs put together and they listened through it and they're like, this just sounds like Transit Blues Part 2. So we're like, not doing that. We, let, we really, we look back on Transit Blues pretty fondly. We would definitely change a number of things if we could, but uh, there's no point in redoing it. Okay. Are you ever worried that the songs are going to crop out or are going to be on like a B-side record and just be the biggest hit you guys ever had? Uh, you know, it's kind of funny when you're talking about B-sides because we've never, ever scrapped songs. Like we scrapped like half of a song when we were doing Transit Blues. But for this record, we're, the goal is to write 20 songs, which is way more than we usually do. We usually write 13 songs or 12 songs and those songs make the record. So we're, uh, we're putting together a bunch of them and then we'll sit down and look at them and say what didn't make the cut so it'll be interesting it'll be uh there will be friction but uh all for the better and uh, hopefully a better different record than what folks have heard awesome well mike thank you so much for your Pleasure, time man. everybody mike of the devil wears prada pick up transit blues if you haven't already with roots above and branches below playing in its entirety tonight new music coming soon we'll see you next time on heavy new york everybody <laughs>